is the UK is the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. Hello and welcome to another UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast. My name is David Maguire and I'm a senior officer in the UK FIU. In this edition, we're looking at virtual assets, what they are, how they work, and some of the complexities faced by law enforcement. And, as with other podcasts, the role that suspicious activity reports, or SARS, and reporters can play. We'll hear from Craig Gleason from the National Economic Crime Centre, or NEC, Phil Aris, who leads on cryptocurrency for the National Police Chiefs Council Cybercrime Programme, and Araba Eshun, who's Head of Compliance and Money Laundering Reporting Officer for Gemini in the UK. As with all our podcasts, no active or sensitive operational work is discussed and panellists' opinions are independently theirs. Okay, so the fifth Money Laundering Directive regulations came into effect in January 2020, the aim being to tackle the risks linked to cryptocurrencies and bring exchange platforms and custodian wallet providers within its scope. These two categories became reporting entities under the new legislation, meaning they're now required to conduct strong customer due diligence, or CDD, much like traditional financial institutions, and to report suspicious transactions to the competent financial intelligence unit. Craig, from a law enforcement perspective, can you provide us with some insight into these changes in anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing legislation? Uh, Yes, certainly. Um, I think, as you say, it's sort of 5MLD. One of the main things it looked to do was to provide greater scrutiny um, onto the virtual currency industry. Uh, to kind of put that into perspective, I'll go back to uh, a time before uh, we had any of these regulations. And the, the basic notion behind crypto was to have a decentralized financial commodity that existed outside of Big Brother um, without government influence, without regulatory influence, and put power and control into the hands of the people. As one can expect, that created a Wild West style environment that was unsurprisingly exploited by criminals. That's not to say everybody that used it at the time had criminal intent, but as with all kind of emerging bits of technology, criminals were one of the main ones to adopt it and seize on the, the anonymity and the fact that it did exist outside of um, any sort of regulatory world and be, uh, would be problematic for law enforcement to investigate. Obviously, cryptocurrency has grown massively uh, as an industry and, and continues to do so at pace. I think a few years ago, the world started to realise that we could not allow this to kind of go unchecked uh, any longer and that it was causing more and more problem um, from a from a crime perspective what 5mld did as you've, you've highlighted was to tighten the industry uh, in terms of the uk it meant that the crypto asset providers fell under the regulatory remit of the fca that included yep the exchanges crypto ATMs, but also the peer-to-peer traders, um, so the ICOs, which is uh, initial coin offerings, which is sort of an investment platform, uh, custodian wallet providers who hold cryptocurrency uh, on behalf of others, and meant they all had to adhere to money laundering regulations. Inevitably, the tightening up of the industry is a massive boost for, for law enforcement. It helps to legitimize the sector, which is uh, beneficial for everybody, but also helps improve public-private partnerships. It enables us to build bridges with the uh, the industry and start working together in order to try and, again, help further legitimize the sector, but also combat crime. and to try and tackle the issues that were going on pre-regulation. The, the fact that the, uh, the regulations came into effect on the 10th of January, 2020, the FCA had granted a year, I think, for everyone to be registered. So that firms had to be registered with the FCA by the 10th of uh, January, 2021. 
And for the benefit of listeners, the FCA is the Financial Conduct Authority. And now you're seeing a dramatic increase in detection and reporting via SARS. Definitely, yes. Um, when you, if you sort of go back two years ago, the the volume of sort of cryptocurrency reporting was quite low, um, predominantly coming from the banks. Predominantly, it's it's linked to a customer has traded in cryptocurrency which is outside the banking policies it doesn't necessarily mean they're a criminal or provide us with great information but what we have seen since 5mld came into effect is a a rise particularly from within the crypto sector they've adopted this and again that's um due to a lot of fantastic outreach work from the uk fiu there's been great participation between them and the industry and in terms of improving the SARS and, and what sort of things to put in. And that has had a massive positive impact. Um, we're seeing huge amounts coming through, which from a law enforcement perspective gives us a fantastic opportunity to build on the intelligence that's coming through. Um, and improve investigations, improve our response, and together we can improve um, the industry as a whole and have tackled the problem of uh, particular sort of money laundering through this methodology. So what would you say is the main criminal use of cryptocurrency? Yes, certainly. Um, historically, it would have been your more sort of cyber crimes. But certainly as, as crypto was was growing, Cyber criminals, due to the obvious links with technology, were the first ones to adopt this in terms of your sort of ransomware, hacking demands, etc. Users of dark web marketplaces also tended to um, buy and sell commodities using cryptocurrency because of its anonymous nature. I would say over the last couple of years, we've seen a shift and I would argue that money laundering is probably now the, the most significant crime, um, criminal use of cryptocurrencies. It's becoming part and parcel of professional money launderers, um, and how they try and, um, obfuscate funds on behalf of a wide range of, of criminal groups. So you're, you're looking at all kinds of criminal activity. Essentially, the way to launder the money, cryptocurrency is one of the big things. Um, this is in large part because of the fact that for a while, it wasn't as well regulated as it is now. It has the anonymizing elements to it. But I think whereas you look at cybercrime and it's about generating funds in crypto with the other sort of acquisitive crimes and the money laundering, a large part of it is about consolidating large volumes of illicit cash, which could be um, physical cash or funds from within the banking sector that they're looking to try and move with greater ease. And essentially, the idea is to convert it into something that can be easily transported and cryptocurrency can essentially be carried on a USB stick or a phone easily transferred across borders without using banking systems. Alongside this, I would argue that fraud is also uh, very prominent, whether this is the cashing out, so the money laundering of fraud, or also just using it as a potential investment hook. I think crypto certainly towards the back end of last year and most of this year has been hitting headlines with Bitcoin rising astronomically and surpassing, I think, $40,000 at one point. With that rise, there is obviously an interest in making money. Fraudsters are very quick to jump on that bandwagon and try and exploit people's um, naivety, I would say, by saying, get rich quick making Bitcoin. I will say it's something that isn't likely to happen. Certainly not anymore. And, but people will fall for that. And I think fraudsters 
as they have done with, with other commodities, with wine, uh, with land. Um, they are using crypto as a, as a hook to, yeah, exploit the vulnerable. You mentioned crypto being used to purchase illicit commodities online. What, what kind of products and services are we talking about here? So on the, on the dark web, you can, you can literally buy anything. So most dark websites, the main commodities that are bought and sold are drugs related. Um, so cocaine, uh, cannabis, they're probably the main products. Um, you will also see there's always, a, oh, there's also a, a large market in compromised card details. So people buying someone else's bank details in order to make transactions using their accounts. That's long since been, um, bought with cryptocurrency. Um, again, the idea is for, for criminals to use something that can essentially anonymize their transactions with all the policies that 5MLD is putting into place, it's going to make it tricky for criminals to do that. But yeah, there's a, there's essentially any, any criminal commodity you can think of will be sold. Okay. So let's look at this now from the reporter perspective. Aruba, Gemini is probably best described as a global platform assisting with the buying, selling and storing of cryptocurrency. How have the new regulations affected your sector and the way that you work? So I think, to be honest with you, um, as Gemini were one of the few um, companies that were authorised by the FCA as a crypto asset service provider under the Fifth Money Laundering Directive, um, I don't feel like it's affected Gemini specifically that much, but I do feel that um, the Fifth Money Laundering Directive came as a bit of a shock for many exchanges that weren't preemptively focused on compliance. Um, it's likely that in the future, some of these exchanges that exist today will be squeezed out of the market. Um, some people will be aware that the FCA has over 100 firms that are temporarily registered under the crypto asset regime. And um, that goes through until the 9th of July, 2021. And I feel like we're yet to see whether any of them or how many of them actually get their permanent registration in place. In, in relation to AML, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing reporting, how, how do staff in Gemini uh, deal with that? So... The team at Gemini um, comply 100% with all relevant regulation and guidance set by the FCA and any other relevant um, regulators. Um, we use multiple tools to monitor customer activity, to detect and um, report potential money laundering or terrorist financing transactions. Um, we've got an automated transaction mon monitoring tool um, that looks for predetermined typologies. Um, we then go in and review those and investigate them. We're very dedicated um, to ensuring that we've got qualified and trained investigators um, within the team that review customer activity holistically um, to determine what actions are needed including filing suspicious activity reports and closing accounts um, where necessary. Uh, and I also want to highlight that I'm a member of the UK FIU's cryptocurrency working group. Um, so it also allows me to help the FIU to better understand trends that we're seeing within the crypto space and to also learn about trends from other cryptocurrency firms. As well as transaction monitoring, we identify illicit actors through know, know your customer checks. Um, I think there's a lot of people that feel that cryptocurrency agencies or firms aren't similar to those in traditional financial services. But I want to highlight that 
at Gemini, we're regulated as an electronic money institution. So we're kind of the same as all of the regulated financial services apps on there, out there. Um, so we collect IDs such as passports and driving licenses. We um, verify a user's residential address. We perform ongoing monitoring and periodic reviews user, using numerous um, third party tools. And you've given us a steer there regarding the steps that Gemini takes in identifying suspicious activity. How does that then translate into actually submitting a SAR? Um, so I'd say when we when we identified potential or confirmed money laundering, terrorist financing or fraud, um, we through transaction monitoring or predictive or proactive analysis, we'll raise a SAR to the UK FIU via the NCA SAR portal. Um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, any type of suspicion should be um, reported and that's kind of the process that we use internally. Okay, I'm going to bring in Phil Aris now, who leads on cryptocurrency for the National Police Chiefs Council Cybercrime Programme. Phil, can you tell us what the NPCC Cybercrime Programme actually is? National Police Chief Council, uh, it brings together police forces in the UK to help coordinate operations, reform uh, and improve and provide value for money. Uh, the Cybercrime Programme is a part of the NPCC. Uh, in essence, it's led by Commissioner Ian Dyson uh, and supported by Assistant Commissioner Andrew McLaren. Uh, what the programme was doing is to initially set up to, to deliver local capability projects, establishing force level uh, cybercrime units across England and Wales. Uh, and this remit has, has widened as time's gone on. Uh, and now the um, cybercrime programme has over 30 live projects, uh, including national training, the rollout of uh, cyber tools app for, for local forces, uh, cyber resilience centres, um, an area which I special in, which is um, cryptocurrency training and tools, uh, police cyber alarm, and, and the creation of a new cyber digital specials and volunteers programme. So a, a really wide variety of programmes. Uh, and the programme team, uh, myself included, are here to support Team Cyber UK network uh, to basically build a world leading uh, policing cyber capability across uh, with the best training tools and technology available to us. Phil, do you have any tangible successes regarding the programme's work that you can share with our listeners? Yes, yeah, so the programme uh, is very successful. Uh, I think I'll talk, probably talk in a selfish point of view, talk about what we've done in the cryptocurrency space, because uh, that's what I'm most passionate about. Um, so over the last sort of two years in, in cryptocurrency, we've taken um, from in essence to cradle to grave uh, a full capability, really. So going back just a couple of years, um, there was very little capability on a frontline level in relation to cryptocurrency. Uh, and we've now developed a, a process where there are cryptocurrency tactical advisors in every single force and rock you. And they've all been trained in cryptocurrency investigations and spotting the initial signs of cryptocurrency usage. Um, We've also delivered guidance uh, to, to investigators and some training um, and a whole host of other sort of um, tools and capabilities that has allowed uh, local, regional and national um, officers, uh, whatever part of Team Cyber, CIB UK they are a part of, uh, the ability to actually um, identify what cryptocurrency usage is uh, and a level of capability to investigate it. Um, so going back two, two or three years, um, we have very rarely seen investigations that involve cryptocurrency. It was mainly within um, um, a few cybercrime units had seen it, um, but weren't really um, dealing with it in the, in the correct manner. Uh, and we certainly hadn't seized any sort of virtual currencies yet. Take that, for instance, to where we are today. Uh, it's now part of um, day to day business within Team Cyber UK. Um, most forces or, or regions are seeing um, significant volumes of uh, cryptocurrency investigations. Uh, we're seeing people being brought to justice in this space. And, and also, uh, which is what I'm really passionate about, is that actually we're taking that away from criminals as far as uh, their benefits from this crime. So the Proceeds of Crime Act is being applied in relation to cryptocurrency usage. So we're seeing a, a huge, huge development in this space. Uh, and that's uh, obviously just in cryptocurrencies, and that's reflected across the whole Team Cyber UK and Navarra 
other sort of program areas in our specialism so we are so the fact that the home office is funding is uh, we really are making significant new strides across cybercrime in the uk two of the attractions of cryptocurrency to criminals are the anonymity uh, it potentially offers and the ability to not have to transfer physical notes etc is that the kind of thing that you're also looking at because obviously cryptocurrency use isn't illegal but there are certain aspects of it which cause concern for law enforcement no Exactly that. So I think it's um, it's changing the mindset, um, not only of, of people within cybercrime, but across policing and across law enforcement. Uh, so it's changing that mindset that actually um, the transition of value between person to person or entity to entity is looking very different today um, than it did five years ago. And it will look very different in five years and 20 years in the future. Um, I'd like to think this is, um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a big proponent of, of cryptocurrency. I, I, I love the protocols, I love the technology, but I understand the risks uh, as well for law enforcement. But I'd like to think that we're on the cusp of something, um, a huge stride in technology. I'll probably liken it to sort of mobile phone usage, maybe sort of 20 years ago. Not many people used mobile phones. There didn't really seem to be a user case for it initially, and people thought it was a fad. Uh, and, you know, here we are today in 2021 when mobile phones are embedded in everything we do. And this is where I see sort of cryptocurrency and, and virtual assets going forward. So coming back in full circle, it's it's basically, yeah, that, that huge mindset change across law enforcement on how the future of finances could, could change rapidly and, and significant changes and how we need to all adapt and evolve to those changes in technology. How important is SAR reporting in this field? So I think it's absolutely vital. So we, again, talking about that analogy of the mobile phone, I think it's really important for people to do the receipt of those SARs and those, those FIs and those investigators to, if they're getting any sort of um, indication that virtual assets and cryptocurrencies are used at an early stage, that can radically change a, a strategy of that investigation. So that early early indication is is absolutely vital, um, especially considering that um, this is still not mainstream policing yet. Uh, there are obviously a a, a a finite number of people that have had training courses, that have access to certain bespoke um, uh, investigational tools. So it's really really important that if we get the chance to raise the flag early, uh, we do so uh, and influence that investigation. Um, it's absolutely vital. Just going back to the fifth anti money laundering directive. Is the fact that firms have to register making law enforcement's role easier or is that pushing people who want to subvert the system to go more underground? So obviously I, wait, oh, I, I, I welcome 5 um, AMLG. I think it was a really important um, milestone for this emerging technology to, to embrace. Um, I think it's really good that we start to get a level playing field of entities in relation to um, how they interact with their customers and what sort of information they record, their responsibilities. However, as you had alluded to there, yes, unfortunately, it will push people down to a, uh, I think, a more peer-to-peer route, uh, a way that's harder to regulate. I mean, there are there are areas of concerns that I that I have that I think are simply just almost impossible to regulate. I think uh, cryptocurrency ATMs. Um, are one of them that they could be rife for abuse. So I'm not sure what what role cryptocurrency ATMs have in the future. Um, so I'll be interested to see how how that changes over time. And I think it's also important as well as why the EU and the UK obviously have it um, regulation in place. There are many areas in the world that don't, sadly, uh, and those weaker jurisdictions and those softer borders will always remain a threat. So it's really important that we try to capture that as much as possible in any SARS uh, and that, that early strategy of investigations. Well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. A number of new SAR working groups have been formed over the last few years, including a cryptocurrency group. And this group enables private sector firms to come together with representatives from law enforcement and the public sector to share best practice and discuss emerging typologies and methodologies. And groups like these help to bring together SAR reporters and the UK FIU at an industry level. And that flow of information goes both ways. So until next time, I've been David Maguire and this has been a UK FIU podcast. 
This is, is the UK is the UK Financial Intelligence Unit podcast.